Welcome Grade 12s. Today we're looking at Learn Extra Exam Revision. What we're going to be doing is looking at business environments. Now business environments are split into three separate things. The first thing that you need to know Grade 12s would be looking at legislation. Now legislation is very important. They ask several questions about this and it could be in any section, section A, B or C. And what is new this year from last year is that you need to know not only the nature, the aims and the purposes, but you also need to know what actions will the compliance as well as penalties if businesses do not comply. So what will happen if a business does not follow the labor legislation as well as actions regarded as discriminatory. Now, what you need to keep in mind, if it is discriminatory, there will be penalties, but we'll look at that in more detail a little bit later. The next part that you need to know would be strategies, so different types of business strategies, and this would also include looking at a SWOT analysis, PESTL, porters, all of those important things, and lastly, part of the business environments would be the three business environments and how they're related to business, um, the three economic sectors. Now you've been doing economic sectors and the business environments since about grade eight or nine, but now at grade 12, you need to be able to link those two together. The first thing we're gonna be doing today with the questions, let's have a look at the first question. The first question is related to legislation. Now what's important with legislation is that you need to know these really, really well because they can ask again in any section and you need to be familiar with this. So let's have a look at the question. So the question states, write out the full term for the abbreviations of the different acts listed in column B. With this question, you need to be careful and that you look at the, the questions first before you just go into multiple choice mode, if, if that makes sense. Now, let's have a look at the first one. So, triple BEE, you need to know what this stands for. So let's have a look at what this is. So, the first thing there is triple BEE, so broad-based black economic empowerment. And not only do you need to know what it stands for, the abbreviation, but you also need to know, obviously, what it all entails. So BEE, Broad-Based Black Economic Empowerment. The second abbreviation they've got there is the BCEA. Now, this is Basic Conditions of Employment Act. Now, remember, with Basic Conditions of Employment Act, it encompasses so many things. It would be working time, um, your, how much lunch break you can take, um, all the safety features as well, and just looking at workers' rights in general and what conditions are appropriate for working. The next abbreviation is BEE, and this follows on from that broad-based black economic empowerment with BEE, and we should all know this by now, grade 12s, quickly think about it. It is black, econ <coughs> black economic empowerment. And what they can do at this level, grade 12s, they can ask you how did BEE, or how does BEE and triple BEE fit together, and how B triple BEE developed from BEE as well. So keep that in mind. The next abbreviation that's there, so D, the COIDA, this is Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act. And this will go hand in hand with other issues like UIF, workman's compensation. So you need to be familiar with that as well as you're going through this. The next abbreviation is the CPA, which is the Consumer Protection Act. Now the Consumer Protection Act is new this year. They haven't focused on it as much. So you need, so you need to make sure that you're very familiar with this. And the Consumer Protection Act also has many different aspects. And if you're not familiar with it, do yourself a favor and go check out some more and just read up on it a bit more. The next one that you should all be familiar with is the EEA or Employment Equity Act. And the Employment Equity Act is, could also go very much hand in hand with BEE and triple BEE. The next abbreviation is the LRA, which is the Labor Relations Act. And what you, well, an important thing to carry with you with the Labor Relations Act is that this is all to do with trade unions, business and employees. So the th those three form the core of the Labor Relations Act. The second last one we have here is the NCA or the National Credit Act. 
And the National Credit Act is also very important. They've asked um, in the past um, lots of essays on this, and you need to be familiar with both short and long questions. And the last one there is the Skills, Skills Development Act. And for the Skills Development Act, you also need to be familiar with CETAs, what are the different aims and functions of CETAs, as well as how they are funded and how these funds are distributed. So I hope you all got the, all of those abbreviations. And it's, it's important that you not only know the abbreviations, obviously, but that you also know what they consist of. And that's what the next part of this question is about, where we sort of delve deeper into it. So let's have a look at this question. So question 1.2, and this is following on from the previous one, we're looking at link the purpose of the different acts in column A with a corresponding acronym for an act in column B. So this is basically match the column, um, but it, it's looking at more the purpose, not just match, match the column. And this is why it's so important that you're not only familiar with the acronym, but you're also familiar with the actual act. So let's look at each of these statements in column A and then link it to column B. The first statement. The first statement, it's collective bargaining process. Now, if you think of collective bargaining, this will entail or you know it will involve trade unions, employers, and employees. And as I said earlier, if it's those three, you know it will be the Labor Relations Act. So let's have a look if it's there. Yes. So the Labor Relations Act. So for collective bargaining, it will be G, Labor Relations. The next statement is fair labor practices. Now, fair labor practices should get you thinking about working times, breaks, um, how much holiday you get, etc. And if you think of that, you should the, the, the automatic link should, should be basic conditions of employment. Um, with basic conditions of employment, it's also important that you remember that for every 17 days worked, you get one day off. And it's also 21 days for the entire year that you're entitled to. So let's have a look. Fair labor practice. Is basic conditions there? Yes, it is. So B, Basic Conditions of Employment Act, will go with that. Often with match the column grade 12s, they'll give you more options than there are more options in, sec in column B than in there are in column A. And it's important that if you, as you go through it, that you take out the ones um, that you've already done. It makes it easier for you to select the next one. Let's look at the third one. Financial support for injured workers. Now, injured workers obviously would require um, time off financial implications. And for injured workers, this will be D, which is compensation for occupational injuries and diseases. Remember, this is compensation, so there will be a monetary value to different types of injuries. And you should also be familiar with the different monetary values of the, the different types of injuries. And remember, it depends on the type of injury, also the compensation. And the next statement is the prevention of unfair discrimination. And this would be Employment Equity Act. Now, the importance of Employment Equity Act, so that would be F. Employment Equity Act is all about having things fair. So no discrimination on the basis of race, age, or gender. And it's about creating a work environment that is fair and equal for everyone. And essentially, businesses want happy workers. Why? Because a happy worker is a hard worker. The next statement, combating or to combat unemployment. And to combat unemployment, this would be the Skills Development Act. Now, the Skills Development Act, as I mentioned earlier, does go hand in hand with the Skills Development Levies Act. And this is where businesses have to pay over a certain amount of money um, towards the fund. And this will also support CETAs, et cetera, which will help develop South Africa in general, which will should theoretically lift the economy. The next statement, six, is broaden South Africa's economic base. And this would be BEE. So, Remember, the point of BEE is trying to get everybody economically active to create a stronger economy, the shorter the long. The next one, number seven, all parties must contribute to the objectives of BEE. Now, remember, grade 12s, BEE and triple BEE go hand in hand. So this statement will already give it away. It will, you know, if it has to go hand in hand with BEE, it can only obviously be A, 
the broad-based black economic empowerment. And it's important, grade 12, that at this stage that you can also differentiate between what is BEE and what is triple BEE. Think about it for a while. And if you're not sure, go back to your textbook and have a look. I'll also remind you later. Next, number eight, protection against negligent lending practices. So the word lending over here, grade 12s, will tell you that this will involve money. And if we know it's money and it's lending, it can only be the National Credit Act. Remember that the National Credit Act was brought into place to try and stop people from recklessly um, lending money from companies or businesses giving out money too easily and not being able to get their money back. So it protects not only business, but it protects consumer as well. So for negligence, for protecting against negligent lending practices, it will be H, the National Credit Act. And the last one, grade 8s and um, grade 12s, it will be promote social and economic welfare of South African consumers. Now, by default, we know it's E because it's the last one left, but also it's about social and economic welfare of South African consumers. That's the Consumer Protection Act focuses on trying to protect the consumer against health hazards, for example, but also a variety of other possible things that could harm the consumer. So question one, legislation. I hope you've got a good idea of what the abbreviations are and what they entail. And as you can see from this match the column, that you need to have an in-depth knowledge of what the act is so that you can answer all these questions. Another important thing, grade 12s, is if we look at the new curriculum this year, what you need to know in addition from previous, which won't necessarily be in all older textbooks, that you need to know, again, compliances, penalties, actions regarded as discriminatory. So double check that you know all the, all the things about the act, but also what the penalties are. And often the penalties would, rev would involve financial, um, of a financial penalty where people have to pay fines for not complying. The next question we're going to be doing is looking at strategies. So question two, let's read through it and we'll have a look further into it. So identify a specific business strategy in each of the scenarios below. So business strategies are there not only, and if you think, think quickly think about different business strategies. So you get SWOT, PESTOL, the, the rest of them, these business strategies are the, the strategies where businesses are either trying to penetrate markets, trying to fix a broken business as such. Um, so let's have a look. These statements, often when they ask questions, these statements are given and you have to identify the type of strategy used here. So first question or the first statement, 2.1. The Virgin group of companies own, amongst others, Virgin Records, so that's one, Virgin Atlantic, and Virgin Active. So what type of strategy is this? If you look at the statement, this is a company that has lots of different interests. And the strategy that they will be using then would be conglomerate diversification or diversification. So when you see a statement of a company where they've got lots of different interests, it will be conglomerate. Good. So 2.2. Foster D started his business in so, so Foster D started his business in Saudi Arabia and has entered the South African cell phone market. So think about it quickly. What type of strategy is this? So it's going from one country to another country. The strategy they've used here is market development. So going from one market into another market and trying to create obviously a financial gain through doing that. I hope I hope these are all coming to you quite easily. And again, like the legislation, you need to know these really well because it's, it's easy for you to get confused between market development, market penetration, and a lot of these statements sound quite similar. So keeping that in mind, let's have a look at the next one. Question, well, statement 2.3. It's Toyota SA, a car manufacturing business, gained ownership of Raylite car batteries. So this is a company that's main function is to produce cars and now, what is part of producing cars? Cars need batteries. So they're basically trying to, well, they're not trying to, they've bought their supplier. So what type of strategy is this? This would be a backward, backward vertical integration or just backward integration, where you are 
buying your supplier to make it easier. Remember, if you have control over your supplier, you've got control over the pricing. Pricing for yourself, but also pricing for competitors. So you can play around with pricing in that sense and gain control of the market through obviously having your supplier on your side. The next statement looks at Grace Limited sold all its assets, sold all its assets in an attempt to pay creditors. So off the bat, you can see from the statement that this company is in trouble. If you're selling assets, you're in trouble. And if you're selling assets to pay your creditors, this should, again, in the strategy frame of mind, should only lead you to one thing. This is liquidation. If you're selling to pay off your credit, this is, like I said, liquidation. And this is a defensive strategy. Companies only use a defensive strategy if they're in trouble. And remember, other defensive strategies would be retrenchment. Um, and companies will only do this if they really, really have to. So this is not about developing your company. It's about tying loose ends, really. And the last statement, Seaswear Clothing Stores has taken over Easy Clothing Stores. So from this statement, we can see this is a clothing store and that is a clothing store. So you're basically taking your competitor on and you're buying your competitor. So the strategy that will go with this is horizontal integration. Now remember with horizontal integration, it is literally taking, so if it's, if we're looking at the car manufacturing, so it'd be one car manufacturing company buying another car manufacturing company. And that's how they go hand in hand. Another important thing, grade 12s, that I want you to keep in mind. So we've done some of the, the, the strategies, but you need to be familiar with all of the strategies. And again, and I'm repeating this because it's important, you need to know the different types of strategies because they sound so familiar. So after question two, we're gonna have a quick break and we'll come back with question three. Welcome back, Grade Twelves. So up to now, we've looked at legislation and we've looked at types of business strategies. The next section we're gonna be looking at is looking at, or the next question which follows on from this is looking at question three, which looks at Porter's Five. So let's have a look at the question. It says, name and explain four of the forces that Michael Porter, so the port, Michael Porter, the Porter's Five, used to analyze the market environment. Now, even though this question seems quite lengthy, what you need to keep in mind here are the, the action words here, grade 12s. So they're asking you to name and they're asking you to explain. So when you're going through the exam, make sure that you look at those, caref look at those words carefully. So, Porter's five. So, first one we're gonna look at, let's open this up, is the bargaining power of suppliers. Now, as I mentioned earlier, with being in control of a supplier, it gives you a lot of power over what's happening inside your business as well as outside. So the first one here, the bargaining power of suppliers. Let's have a look at what they've got to say. So the bargaining power of suppliers is also described as the market of inputs. Remember, you need raw materials, etc., to get your company, well, to have your company function properly, and your supplier will obviously be your supplier of your raw materials if you are producing something. So this would be your inputs. Next, supplies of raw materials, components, labor, services, etc., to the firm can be a source of power over the firm when there are few substitutes. So if you're producing goods that need specific things, so specific raw materials, um, certain types of metal, depending on what your supply, who your supply is, it will influence your pricing as well. So this is where you cannot substitute metal with wood, for example, if you're building a car. So if there are a few substitutes, that will affect the price. The next part, and this is just an example, so if you're making biscuits and there's only one person who sells flour, you have no alternative but to buy it from them. And this is what a lot of companies often do. They try and corner the market in the sense that we are the only people supplying, so we can dictate what's happening in the market and how much we can, how much we can charge for this. And the last point here is um, suppliers may refuse to work with a firm or charge excessively high prices for unique resources. And with unique resources, as I'm saying this, remember scarcity. 
the more scarce something is, the more you will have to pay for it. So again, not only will demand pay, play a role in this, but also how scarce the product is that you're trying to get a hold of. So the first one of the Porter's Five would be the bargaining power of suppliers. So that's the second one. Let's have a look. Bargaining power of buyers. So the bargaining power of a customer is also described as the market of outputs. Now the ability of customers to put the firm under pressure, which also affects the customer's sensitivity to price changes. So the bargaining, bar bar bargaining power of buyers. If you're a large company and your, your supplier, if, if, if you're the largest company that buys from them, you obviously have a lot of say in what's happening there. And what I mean with a lot of say, it would be if you spend 100,000 Rand a month with this company, they obviously need to A, look after you, but B, be very careful not to lose you as a customer. And that's where that power comes in, where companies, suppliers, don't want to lose their, their buyers. And that gives the buyer quite a lot of power. The next part to this would be firms can take measures to reduce buyer power, such as implementing a loyalty program. So how do they reduce the buyer's power? Loyalty programs. And that, so if you buy from us every month 100,000 Rand, you pay on time, we will give you 10% discount. And that sort of takes, they take their power back by doing that because if you go to another supplier now, they may not give you that 10%. So firms can also play around with that. As a, as a supplier, that's how you can try and gain control back as the power lies with the buyer in this case. And the last part, the buyer power is high if the buyer has many alternatives. So many alternatives, if there are substitutes, for example, so if whether I buy wood from you or from the next person, it, it, it doesn't really matter. I just need that raw material. So if there are many alternatives or substitutes, the supplier loses power. Good. So let's have a look at the third one. The third part of the Porter's Five is the threat of substitutes. And as I've mentioned, substitutes will most definitely affect um, a business when they're buying raw materials. If you can buy something for cheaper, remember we're looking at producing, for example. So if, you're, if you can spend less on your raw materials and keep your prices the same, obviously you're going to push your profit margins up. So this will be a very important thing for businesses to look at. So first part, yeah. So with substitutes, the existence of products outside of the realm of the common product Boundaries increase the propensity of customers to switch to alternatives. Now, an easier way for you to look at it, if you go after, if after school today, you go to the shop and your mom or dad asks you to buy bread, and if you, don't, if you usually buy the one brand of bread and they don't have it, you're not going to think a lot to turn to the next brand of bread. Why? Because there's so many alternatives available and you're not too stuck on which brand you're buying. And again, companies lose power through those substitutes, for example, or those alternatives that you have as a consumer. The next part, so what they've got here, so an example, tap water might not be considered a substitute for Coke, whereas Pepsi is a competitor's similar product. So what they're saying here is we have, we have choices as a consumer. And with that comes, if, if we can't find the one thing, like I mentioned with the bread, we'll go somewhere else. And companies need to be aware of this. And this also, you can bring this into other issues like making sure you've got enough stock, making sure businesses are selling your product properly, et cetera. The, f the next part of the port is five year. And even though the question just said name four, let's, let's do all five just to make sure we've got it all. The next one, the intensity of rivalry amongst competitors. So part of this one, they look at for most industries, the intensity of the competitive rivalry is the major determinant of competitiveness of the industry. So what are they saying here? Remember, if you have one company and you're selling something similar to another company, there's going to be competitive rivalry. You're going to look at trying to make your product better, trying to look at prices. And this is good for consumers because it pushes companies to, to raise their game in the sense that we get better products and better prices. But they could also, what happens with companies and businesses, they they, they sort of price each other out of the market and then it no longer becomes profitable. And the last one here, Great Wells, is the threat posed by new entrants or the barrier to entry into a market. So this part of the Port is Five, they're looking at a new company coming into an existing market. So let's just stick with the bread. So I've decided I want to start a company where I also sell bread. 
and if I'm a new producer or new face in the market, it'll be quite difficult for me to convince customers to buy my product, but I'll also have a lot of competition. So keep that in mind. Let's have a look at what they say. So profitable markets that yield high returns will attract new firms. And that makes sense. If, if you're an entrepreneur and this is something we really encourage, um, you're going to enter into a new market and if it looks like people are making a lot of money, well, that makes sense. But there's a downside to this. Now, this will result in many new entrants, which will eventually decrease profitability for all firms in the industry. So as a new company, I'm trying to get, in, I'm trying to get into the market. I want to sell my product. But the more people enter the market, again, remember I told you about sort of thinking about price wars, things like that. People will have to start dropping their prices to become or stay competitive. And this will eventually mean the more people in the market, the less profit all companies will make. And that will obviously very much influence how much you'd like to be in the business or not. Now that we've done the Porter's five great twelves, I do, however, just want to quickly remind you, remember part of these strategies, we looked at strategies um, with the de um, defensive strategies, etc. We've looked at Porter's five, but I also want you to not forget, remember there's Pestle and an oldie but a goodie, a SWOT analysis. And SWOT analysis in general are asked where they give you different options, where you read a case study and you need to take information from that case study or options given to complete your SWOT analysis. And just a quick reminder on a SWOT, and this is always easy to remember, so strengths and weaknesses, these two, are internal. So when you're reading a case study and somebody's saying that they've got a degree um, but they, they battle to concentrate, etc., you know these are internal problems. So when you're filling the SWOT in, Remember, internal will go with strengths and weaknesses, whereas opportunities and threats are external. So what does this mean? We have no control over it. So let's say, for example, your, your business is growing trees and there's a, a fire breaks out or there's a flood. Now, you cannot control any of those variables. So that is why they become external issues. So, so let's just quickly recap. So strengths and weaknesses are internal opportunities and threats are external and again when filling it in keep that in mind so what we've done up to now is looked at um, pestle swat we looked at other strategies um, that businesses can use to either penetrate the market defend their business um, or even go into looking at defensive strategies like liquidation for example so at the end of that, let's look at the next section. And this question is question four. And let's have a look. So study the illustration below and answer the questions that follow. So the illustration below, it's a diagram. And let's have a look. So it's Rossi's Grape Farm, Boerland Wineries Limited, and Cousins Wholesalers PTY Limited. What's the first question? The question asks us, name the business sector in A and B. C. So at this stage, grade 12s, you should be able to identify businesses from their names. So keeping in mind that if it's just a normal, if it's a sole trader or a partnership, the name will be quite simple. And as we go further on into it, that companies will have specific things or specific parts to their name that they have to have. So the name of the business in sector A and C. So firstly, you need to be able to identify these companies but also the different sectors. So if it's a grape farm, we know it's farming. Farming, so it will be extraction. We know part of this would be fishing, mining, and this would be the primary sector. And for B, um, which is actually, sorry, this is for C, the tertiary sector, so cousins wholesalers. So if we look at a wholesaler, remember we know this is, they are selling, and this will be tertiary. Remember from primary, it's extraction, secondary, it's manufacturing, and tertiary would be to getting into the final consumer or getting into the final part. So name the business sector in A. A is primary because it's farming, and B will be, ter uh, sorry, C will be tertiary because it's a wholesaler. Remember, this could also have been a retailer, for example. So let's have a look at the next question. Identify the form of ownership in B and C. I sort of jumped the gun a little bit on that one. So the form of ownership, and let's have a look at the names and how this will influence it. So 
the form of ownership in B, so we can see it says limited. And in C, it's PTY limited. And what's important here, grade 12s, is that you can identify the form of ownership just from that. So for this, let's have a quick look. So limited, you know that limited is for a public company. And PTY limited would be for a private company. And remember, why are these important? Because public and private companies have different requirements for tax, um, how they can sell shares, how shares are distributed, and obviously this will also influence profits. And while we're on the topic, grade 12s, remember CCs or closed corporations can no longer be formed, but you still need to know all the information about that. But the most important part there, no new CCs can be formed. And on that, let's have a quick break and we'll come back with question five. Welcome back, grade 12s. We're going to be looking at question five now, which is an essay question. Now remember, each exam will always be split into three sections. Section A, which would be the short questions. Section B, which would be the medium type questions, where you've got case studies, um, more paragraph kind of questions. And section C, which will be your essay questions. Now, essays are very important. And always remember, leave at least 30 minutes per essay. And don't go over it, don't go under it. Try and time yourself because essays are about timing. So let's have a look at this essay. So question five, and this is from the November paper. Now, the National Credit Act was put into place to improve the way we, as consumers, have been using credit. Now, with improvement comes change, and one of the important changes is that we need to recognize the importance of determining whether we can afford credit. And this was from a health magazine. So this is a statement, and it's sort of trying to get you to think and towards where the essay is going. So what are they asking you in this essay? So discuss the purpose, advantages, and disadvantages of the National Credit Act to both businesses and consumers. So that's the first part of this question, grade 12. So how does the National Credit Act affect business and consumers and the question is asking you looking at advantages and disadvantages. What is new this year, besides the advantages and disadvantages and general aims, remember you need to, um, besides this, you also need to know about what actions are regarded as um, discriminatory and as well as this, also keeping in mind penalties. Um, sorry. So the penalties um, for not following this act properly. So keep in mind, so when you look at these previous papers, do that, but keep in mind all these little extras that have been part of this year's curriculum. And also, this question goes further, explain the National Credit Act in terms of consumer rights and indicate what can be done when a consumer's application for credit is declined. So this is quite a lengthy question, grade 12s, and what you'll need to do is break this question down and try to make sense of it before you get into the essay. So let's quickly just recap on what you need to do in an essay. So you will have your introduction, and in your introduction, um, you need to give facts, definitions, and this is worth two marks. Then when you get into your body, this is where you need to get into the, the meat of your topic and where you're going to explore what they've asked you. And then you're going to have your conclusion. Now your conclusion is also worth two marks. And this is also, again, try and make it relevant. And if you can, what's nice to use in a conclusion is something that is relevant to South Africa. So if we're speaking about the National or the Consumer or the National Credit Act, why is this important that we as South Africans are aware of our rights? with credit, for example. So this in total, if you remember, will be out of 32. And the last part of your essay that you need or that you get marks for is lasso. And remember lasso, it's layout, analysis, synthesis, and originality. And this will be out of eight. So together, you will have your mark out of 40 for your essay. So let's have a look at this essay, break it down, have a look at the introduction, the body, and remember, keep in mind when you're doing your essays that you go back to your essay question and make sure that you 
you, you're sure of what you're doing and what you're writing about and how many points you should write about. So I'm going to read the question one more time and then we're going to go to it. So discuss the purpose, advantages and disadvantages of the National Credit Act to both businesses and consumers. And remember, you need to keep in mind penalties and what is regarded as discriminatory. And this essay is also asking you to look at um, explain the National Credit Act in terms of the consumer rights as well as indicate what can be done when a consumer's application to credit is declined. So there's several parts to this essay. First part to this essay, Grade 12, let's have a look at the introduction. So this is, remember, the National Credit Act. So many consumers overspend when buying on credit. It's easy to, not, it's not as easy to get credit, but people get credit and they tend to overspend and they cannot necessarily have the money to pay back what they've done. Now, the National Credit Act was put in place to improve the debt of both business and consumers. And let's do one more. Remember, this your introduction is out of two, so you only really need two points, but you need to have meaty points, so something that you, you're giving a definition or you're explaining what the National Credit Act is. And the last example, yeah, the Act ensures that we are using credit in a way that adds value to our lives. So not just using credit for the sake of using credit. And um, this is important, especially in South Africa with socioeconomic issues we have, where we don't want people to get trapped in the debt cycle. So this is the introduction done. Nice, simple. You get the person who's marking this a good idea of that you know what you're doing when you're writing this. What is the purpose of the National Credit Act? So it protects consumers. And remember, when you're doing this SNR, you literally, and I like to tell my grade 12s to do this because it actually it helps, you give you, helps give you structure. So when you're doing your introduction, write introduction and do your introduction. When you get to your body, write body, do the information, write down the information for your body, and the last thing, when you get to the conclusion, you write conclusion. And it, it, it's important because it, it makes it easier for the person marking your essay to see where you are and for you to get that mark for layout as well. So the purpose of the National Credit Act, it protects consumers against unfair credit agreements. So example, charging high interest rates when above the maximum stipulated law. So often what companies did before the National Credit Act was they charged whatever they wanted to really and people just had to pay it. And you could see how that could cause problems if somebody say, well, I'll give you this, but you have to pay me 50% interest. And th that made it unfair because often they preyed on people who couldn't necessarily to afford to pay that back. Next, another purpose of the National Credit Act it introduces a single functional system of regulating that will apply to all credit activities. So they're just making, they made it, they've made it a standard. So if you're going to um, sell something on credit or if you're going to get money, what are the laws, what's stipulated, and people have to follow it, which protects, again, consumer and the business. Now, there's lots of examples there, grade 12s, and you can go through more of the purpose and aims, but basically, Long of the short, the purpose was to protect consumers and businesses against reckless lending. Now, let's go down. So you'll see here also, grade 12s, any three times two. So what does that mean? So you're going to write three facts, and you're going to get two marks per fact. So it's important that you, when you're planning your essay, for example, how many points am I going to write in my body that will answer all the questions? Because it's not worth writing everything on the purpose of the National Credit Act, but you haven't answered the rest of the question. So let's have a look. Business services providers. So what are the advantages of the National Credit Act to businesses? Remember, the question asks you to separate it. So let's have a look here. So the first advantage, more prudent buying. So people are more aware of what they're doing. And it, it just it's, again, I think it's very much a safety thing to try and get our economy to stabilize and improve, really. Now, the next point, the whole credit process is transparent. So if you apply for a credit card, for example, you get a whole document that states exactly how much you have to repay, um, the terms, conditions, and you know what you're getting into um, before you sign the contract. And that, that is part of the National Credit Act where consumers know exactly what they're getting into, businesses know, know what they're getting the consumers into, and that's part of the transparency. Next, it lowers bad debts. Those of you who do accounting, this should be very familiar. So the bad debts would be people who cannot repay their debt. So often businesses gave out excessive credit and people couldn't repay it. So what had to happen was people had to write off that debt. And that basically means 
then you know you're never going to get that money in so that was bad for business and let's do one last one there's better cash flow because people tend to to use cash more instead of credit because of the stricter national credit act laws now let's go down what are the disadvantages and again let's quickly have a look at the market location again three times two so it would be your six marks so three points per per advantage now the disadvantages of the national credit act for businesses now off the top of your head you can already think um, that if businesses aren't giving providing credit um, some people may not be inclined to go buy there because they don't have the cash on hand so first off you know pe businesses might have less business so let's have a look so a decrease in credit sales due to um, customer loss and economic decline so less people are tend less people are tending to get credit because of the economy not being as strong and people being more aware of the fact that they'd rather live within their means. Next, they may be restricted in getting generous overdraft facilities. So in the past, an overdraft is when you go to the bank and you can draw withdraw more than what you've got in your account. And obviously there's a, in, there's, you can have to pay interest on it. And again, it created a whole cycle of debt. And let's do one more. Creditors may not pester consumers to agree to a credit agreement telephonically or through a, vi through a visit at their home. So according to the National Credit Act now, people, they are not, companies are not allowed to just phone you up and say, listen, I want you to get this new, let's say, credit card and carry on and just sort of pester a person. So companies are no longer allow literally allowed to do this. So seven next, let's have a look at the next slide. So we looked at the consumer uh, at the business. Now we're going to look at the consumer. So what are the advantages for consumers? So the first one, it protects consumers against unfair credit practices. Again, like I said, where people were exploited, where they let's say charge 30, 40 percent for something, um, that was actually it, it's just not fair, really. And um, this protects them. The next one, it protects customers from receiving credit that they are not able to repay. So with what happens often now with businesses, what they'll do is before you can apply for any type of credit, you have to give bank statements, your pay slip, and this basically makes it, it ensures that you can afford what you're doing. So if you want to take out a 10,000 Rand loan, can you repay that loan? And that's how it protects. Next, relieve consumers who do not understand the risk involved and therefore become over indebted. So that's all about information so giving consumers all the information they need so that they can make an informed choice and by informed it means are you do you know how much interest you're going to pay how much time do you have to pay it back and things like that next it protects customers by restricting trading hours for direct sales so how long or how direct sales so that would be how long can regular shops be open for example and obviously because there's still internet sales, if you think about a grade 12, so you'll still be able to buy stuff online, but you can't go to, let's say, a normal retailer at three o'clock in the morning. And what also is new with the National Credit Act, they provide debt counseling. So if you do not, if you get over indebted or if you're starting to get into trouble with the National Credit Act, they provide debt counseling where you, before you have to, let's say, um, get into very big trouble, the debt counseling will help you. And again, let's have a look, it's any three times two, so that the advantages would be worth six marks. So if we look at the advantages, let's have a look at the disadvantages for consumers. So what are the disadvantages of the National Credit Act to consumers? Firstly, consumers who are blacklisted cannot access credit. Now it's important that you know terminology, so if you're unsure blacklisted, means you cannot get any credit of any form because they've revoked your almost privilege to have credit. So if you have been blacklisted, you cannot have credit for a number of years. The next disadvantage, this could lead to a drop in the standard of living. And again, if we look at just the words that you need to know at this stage, standard of living. So how do you live? Where do you live? What do you eat? Your level of comfort, things like that. So it may lead to a drop in standard of living, but on the other hand, if your standard of living is based on credit, uh, eventually it's going to run out. So it's about trying to get people to live within their means. The next disadvantage, customers are not always informed why their credit application is turned down. So a company could just say, no, we're not giving you any credit of any form, done. So that could be a disadvantage. And lastly, 
what they said there, well, again, any three times, two. So that will give you your six marks. Now, another part of that question was they asked you the initial advantages, disadvantages. And again, remember the penalties and those extra things that are part of the curriculum this year. The next part of this question was consumer rights in terms of the Credit Act. So what are our rights? So let's have a look. Consumer rights. So the first one, it's the right to apply for credit. So literally part of the Consumer Act is that anybody can apply for credit, obviously if you're older than 18, and there's some restrictions, um, obviously, but again, looking at the history and the legacy of South Africa, um, this is important that anybody can apply for this. Next, uh, another consumer right, protection against discrimination in respect of credit. So people cannot discriminate against you if they do not and discriminate in the sense of whether they give you credit or not um, on something that we protected in, in our constitution. So, for example, you cannot not receive credit because you're a woman, because um, that's against the law. So that's part of protection, yeah? Next, obtain reasons for credits being, obtain reason for credit being refused. So if you are refused credit, you get, well, you're entitled to know why are you refused credit. So is it because you do not make enough money, because you already have too much debt, for example, but you have to know why you can't get it. Um, another part of the consumer rights is information in plain and understandable language. So any documents you get, so let's go back to the credit card application I spoke about earlier. If you get any information, it should be, for example, in a language that you understand and in a way that you understand it. So written in, for example, I speak English, so it's, it's in English and it's written in a way that I can understand what I'm getting myself into really. The next one, to receive documents as required by the Act. So I cannot get, let's carry on with a credit card, I cannot get a new credit card um, if I did not receive all the information and give all the information. And confidential treatment of information. So if I do provide my information, let's say my bank statements, my pay slip, all of those things that are required, that the company that does receive this information, they have to keep it confidential. So they cannot give that information to any other company, for example. And the last one, yeah, that we'll do, it's the right to access and challenge credit records and information. So not only do you, should you receive information about why you did not receive credit, for example, and it should be when you're signing a contract in the language that you understand, you also have the right to challenge, okay, so you declined my credit application, but why? And if, if the, the answer isn't good enough for you, really, you can push and say, well, according to the law, or even this, just push it or pursue it from a personal level. So it gives you the right to do that. And the last part here, what can consumers do if they are refused credit? Sorry, well, not the last part. But what can you do if a consumer's application for credit is declined? So let's have a look. A credit provider needs to provide you with a reason, so a valid reason. So let's say you don't make enough money. Next, the consumer may request a written reason for the decline. So not only do they tell you, but you can receive, let's say, an email or something through the post to say why. Then you can reapply for credit. So even though they've declined, you can always try again. And lastly, provide information to support the reason for the decline. So it's, it's really, so if, if your application for credit has been denied according to the National Credit Act, you have the right to have all of this information um, told to you, written, and with an explanation that is valid. And let's have a look. The last part here, remember your conclusion, grade 12s, is just, in, just as important as your introduction. So this is sort of like bringing the whole essay together, but still sticking with facts. And again, I, I like to encourage people to use relevant South African examples for the introduction and the conclusion especially because it, it helps you A, write your conclusion, but B, it also shows the person who's marking your paper that you're up to date with information and that you know what's going on. So let's have a look at their conclusion. So customers have the responsibility to take ownership of credit by honoring payment. So yes, you have the right to ask for credit and receive credit, but it's your responsibility to keep up with payments and make sure that you're bringing your side of the bargain. And the last point here, the Act allows and enables responsible lending and eliminates reckless borrowing. So responsible lending from the consumer's perspective and, you know, and eliminates reckless borrowing from businesses in the sense that businesses don't have bad debts that they have to write off and consumers 
aren't getting trapped in any sort of debt. So you can see grade 12s, essay is vital, vital. When you get to your prelims coming up, when you get to finals, when you get to all of these important exams, during any exam, grade 12s, your essays, you need an hour to do them if there are two. And for your, like I said, for the, the big exams, um, for example, you're going to have two essays. So that's 30 minutes, 30 minutes each. So that leaves you with two hours to do the rest of your the rest of the exam, and planning becomes important. So when you sit down, look at your paper, look at the essays. Another important thing, grade 12. So I've used an example of the National Credit Act as an essay for this section, but what people and what I also often do, often do is take different acts and combine them. So I can ask you to write about um, BEE and so broad-based black economic empowerment and how that relates to um, employment equity. And you have to be able to marry the two concepts and provide an essay that goes well with that. So to recap, make sure that you know what you're reading, how you're reading it, and plan what you're going to do. Thank you very much, Grade 12s, and see you next time.